Greetings, everybody. Chaplain Bob Walker here, Light of the World Ministries. In John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. And boy, my computer has been ramping up like crazy. I mean, I'm not doing anything on the computer, hardly at all. And it's running at like 50, 60, 70 percent uh, capacity and there's nothing on there there's nothing running i'm just looking at a what you know maybe a, a a text document or something yeah somebody's going through the computer but hey they're going to hear a lot about jesus uh all right well this is going to be part two of the Moses compared and contrasted with Paul. And uh, I saw some information on this on the internet and things started kind of popping into my head. I was thinking, yeah, this would make, th this is some really interesting stuff. So let's keep that in mind. Something to consider in the book of Revelation, when it talks about the New Jerusalem, the foundation of New Jerusalem is the, the prophets, you know, which is the, uh, you know, the Old Testament prophets, Malachi, Obadiah, Haggai, Isaiah, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, and uh, Moses was a prophet. Technically, he knew what would happen in the latter days. So, and, you know, I'm just naming a few. They were the foundation of the New Jerusalem. But how do you get into the New Jerusalem? Well, the 12 gates are the names of the 12 tribes and the apostles. And what do the apostles teach? Christ. So the New Jerusalem, there you go. The foundation was the prophets. The gates are the for the 12 tribes, which were the uh, 12 apostles. And you take 12 apostles minus Judas Iscariot plus Paul. 12. Problem solved, right? Real easy. Easy peasy. All right, let's take a look at how Paul compares with Moses. And I'm just going to, there's going to be a few things I'm going to just throw out there and I'm not going to go into a lot of detail because I don't consider them all that important, but I will mention something. And if somebody's interested in proving it from the Bible, uh, I'll post the verses and you can read the chapters if you wish. Um, there's a lot of, you know, anybody that hasn't read Genesis is going to have trouble with the rest of the Bible. Genesis is the foundation for the rest of the Bible. I mean, it just, it's one of, I consider it one of the most important books. And, you know, it tells you, for example, the Lord blessed Ishmael, which was Abraham's first son, but he wasn't to be the chosen seed. The chosen seed would not come from Ishmael. It would come from um, Isaac. Period. And people don't even know where Ishmael ended up. They don't even have. They don't even know who who is Ishmael today. Ugh. The Bible tells you if you read it. You know, all you got to, it's a puzzle and you got to put the puzzle together. 
Ishmael lives in the Middle East. He was to be called a wild man. Are there any people living in the Middle East that are wild men? Yeah. Yeah, they have names like Muhammad. Yeah. So, all right, let's get going here. All right, so how are Paul and Moses similar? Well, as we mentioned, Moses was credited with writing books of the Bible, and Paul was cons uh, credited with writing books of the Bible. So, when the Lord called Paul, Saul, Paul, Saul who became Paul, where did Paul go right after the Lord had called him? Did he go to Jerusalem to tell the Jews the good news? No. Guess where he went? Arabia. Arabia? Yeah, he went to Arabia. Uh, most people believe that the modern area of Saudi Arabia is ancient Arabia. I find no reason to dispute that. Um, so let's take a look. Turn your King James Bibles to the book of Galatians. Tell you what, let's read. We may as well read the entire chapter of Galatians, chapter 1. Let's see, Paul, verse 1, Paul, an apostle, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead. And all the brethren which are with me unto the churches of Galatia, grace be to you and grace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. I should mention something here. There are people, they'll talk about dispensations. And if you look that word up, it comes from the word to dispense, which means to give something. You know, uh, when payroll dispenses payroll checks, you know, your paycheck, you know, or have you ever heard of a soap dispenser? Yeah, but the uh, modern day churches, especially they of the Baptist persuasion will say, oh, that's periods of time. And they'll chop the Bible up into numerous periods of time. Seven being one of the most common But in the Bible, the Bible only talks about two dispensations. The Old Covenant and the New, or the New Testament and the Old Testament. Or as Paul eloquently put it, Moses was the dispensation of law. Christ was the dispensation of grace which is unmerited favor there was nothing i could ever do to deserve god's grace believe me nothing so when people start talking about dispensations and they start talking about seven periods of time you know you're talking to either somebody that's deceived or a heretic if they're a pastor, probably a heretic. Um, you know, that's the, the only two times Paul talks about a dispensation is law and grace. That's it. There's no seven periods of time. You know, that comes from uh, the Schofield Bible, who was a devil in his own right. May he get his reward. So... All right, uh, Galatians 1, 3. Grace 
be to you in peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil world, according to the will of God and our Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. I marvel, you know, I'm surprised, I'm shocked, that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. And that's what dispensations, the seven dispensations are. They're another gospel. Uh, a lot of times they have what's called dual covenant theology. They'll tell you that the you-know-whos have their own separate covenant with God the Father and that they don't need Jesus. Yeah, uh, the J word. And they're going into the kingdom with or without Jesus. Doesn't matter. They got their own little thing. You know, God made an unconditional covenant with them and they're in. In like Flint, if you remember that movie, you're old, like me. James Coburn, I actually liked him as an actor. He's one of the few actors I actually liked. But, yeah, Hollywood, right? But uh, do you know that in the dispensational theology, and by the way, I have a master's degree in the Bible from a Baptist Bible college, cemetery, so I know exactly what they teach. Don't tell me that I don't know what they teach. I do. And that was the reason I went to Bible college, so that I could learn their lies so that I could refute them. Now, I hope I'm doing a good job, but hey. Um, they actually teach that in the, after the pre-trib rapture of the church, that the age of grace closes and now you're in the tribulation period and there is another way to be saved. You can't just believe in Jesus anymore. Now you got to keep the law, huh, and die for your faith. Yeah, they actually teach this. So what they're saying basically is uh, you're going to have to bring a, a lamb to the rabbi to kill it and shed its blood for your sins, which didn't work in the first place, but figure that one out. And then you're going to probably end up having to die for your faith, uh, keep the law, to be saved. Uh, where's that in the Bible? It's not. You get that from the Schofield Reference Bible and a guy named Clarence Larkin, which I cannot find any information on the guy. Nothing. I mean, you know, somebody, somebody writes a book uh, on a on a word that appears four times in the Bible, I mean, you better beware. And not only that, uh, somebody should have, anybody that doesn't have a statement of faith on their site, be very wary of. I mean, seriously. What does the guy believe? I mean, you know, what do they believe? One of my fa favorites... I'm being sarcastic, by the way, is when people say, well, we believe the Bible in the original manuscripts or the originals or whatever. What they're saying is, well, we believe the Bible as far as when, like, Moses came down from the mountain with the, the tables of stone, you know, the Ten Commandments. But we're not sure about when they transferred the Ten Commandments from the stone to the modern-day Bible that we have today. It might be wrong. We don't know. I mean, we don't have the original manuscripts, or they'll call it original autographs, or they have a couple of little words there. So, so if you don't have the original writings from the original authors, like 
the book of Jeremiah. You know, what did Jeremiah write down, or Baruch, which was his uh, scribe, his his secretary? If you don't have that, oh, we're not sure. Yeah, we, we, we believe the Bible as far as the originals, but the originals don't exist anymore, so we're not really sure. You know, it, it might be true in the Bible, but yeah, we're not sure. So basically what they're telling you is that they serve a God that was unable to transfer the originals to the copies we have today. You know, like they got lost somewhere. Boy, they give Satan a lot of credit. They really do. A lot more credit than they give God the Father. You think God the Father couldn't transfer his words from Moses to today? Is God so weak? Yeah, that's they, they actually believe this stuff. So, if you think that you're going to have to die for your faith, I mean, that's the only way or you got to keep the law in the tribulation period to be saved. That's another gospel. And Paul says those that preach another gospel are cursed. And now you know why they don't like Paul. Why they want to remove his writings. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, the Old Testament... In the New Testament and the tribulation period, people are saved by faith in Jesus Christ. There is no other back door for the Jays or the tribulation saints. Oh, they're devils. They're devils. And you know what the difference between me and them? I don't pass the collection plate around. That's the difference between me and them. Or them and I. So, all right, let's go back and read Galatians 6, 1, 6. I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. Another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you. And would pervert the gospel of Christ. Are you starting to see why they don't like Paul? And who are these people? Well, they're the Yeshua crowd today. Yeah. Another gospel. But though we, verse 8, but though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you, than that, than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed or accursed. Guess who had an angel from heaven? Muhammad had an angel from heaven and gave him whatever the Quran. Is there another group that had an angel from heaven come down and give golden plates to Joseph Smith, uh, yeah, his name was Moron I. Well, they call him Mor Moroni, but if you look at the first four or five, well, first five letters, it's Moron, M-O-R-O-N, I. And then if you read it from uh, right to left, like they do in Hebrew, it's I Moron. Well, you know, whatever. Yeah. Mormonism, another gospel. Islam, another gospel. Dispensationalism, dispensation, theology, another gospel, which is not a gospel. They're accursed, people. They're cursed. And Paul tells you they're cursed. And I believe Paul. And I believe the one that sent Paul, which was Jesus. Verse 10, for do I now persuade men or God? 
or do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. I can understand that. Boy, I got a lot. I get a, I've gotten a lot of hate mail in my life. And I bet you Benny Hinn doesn't get as much hate mail as I do. And he's 10,000 times more popular than I am. 11. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of mine is not after man. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation, revelation means to reveal, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. For ye have heard of my conversion in time past in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it. Hmm. And profited in the Jews' religion above many my equals in mine own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my fathers. Uh, Jesus didn't have anything good to say about the traditions of the elders, as they called it. Jesus called them the traditions of men. I got an entire Bible study on traditions. Jesus did not have not one good thing to say about traditions. Who, what groups are steeped in traditions? Well, when Paul, before he became a Christian, his group was steeped in traditions. Uh, the Vatican, traditions. Eastern Orthodox, traditions. Yeah. And rituals uh, it's just it's not pleasing to the Lord Lord wants us to love from the heart not you know statues and prayer shawls and I don't know does that stuff make you holy I don't think so but hey that's just one guy's opinion so Verse 15, but when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace. Paul was called by the grace of, by his grace. To reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the heathen. And Paul went to the Greeks. And what were the Greeks? Why were they considered heathens? Well, they had all the, look at all the gods they had. They had Apollo and Mercury and uh, Zeus, uh, Aphrodite, uh, the goddess. You know, they had all these Greek gods. And, uh, and, and if you're not careful, uh, and if you listen to the so-called Hebrew roots devils, they'll tell you that Jesus is calling upon Zeus. Jesus, that's what they'll tell you. Oh, yeah. I don't think so. You know, there's a reason why the New Testament was written in Greek and not Hebrew. When Jesus was uh, at the cross and he said, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, everybody standing around said, oh, he's calling for Elijah. But that's not what he said. He said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? They didn't even know what he was saying. And he was, I'm sure Jesus knew Hebrew full well. So Hebrew was kind of a dying language even back then. Sure, the people, you know, the, the those that were trained in it understood it, but was it a common language? I don't think so. You know, when Paul was, I mean, I'm sorry, when Jesus was talking to uh, Pilate, 
You think he was talking to Pilate in Hebrew? No. No, probably Greek or Latin. Possibly Greek. There's some people who think Jesus uh, preached in Greek to the masses. That wouldn't surprise me in the least. It really wouldn't. One day, we will know the truth. But not today. So, All right, so in verse 16, to reveal his son in me that I might preach him, Jesus, preach Jesus, him, among the heathen, immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. Paul didn't go to people to, to learn, to preach. Verse 17, listen carefully. This is the important part. This is the whole reason I'm reading this. Neither went I up to Jerusalem. Paul didn't go to Jerusalem when he got saved. No, uh-uh. Neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me. But I went into Arabia. But I went into Arabia and returned again unto Damascus. Paul was saved on the road to Damascus, remember? Where's Damascus? It's Syria, which is near, it's the neighbor of the land of Israel. All right, verse 18. Then after three years, Paul went to the desert for three years. Think about that. I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and abode with him 15 days. And like I say, there's people that will tell you, oh, Paul's a false apostle. But Peter didn't know that Paul was a false apostle because God, the Father, had the Holy Spirit fail to tell him, hey, uh, watch out for this guy. He's a fake. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, those that hate Paul, those are the fakes. And the Bible, and Second Peter says that uh, those that... Uh, Basically, it paraphrases those that don't like Paul uh, wrestle other scriptures to their own destruction, that they're unlearned and unstable. Read Second Peter; it tells you. It's you know. Now, Arabia, Sinai. Uh, Bible scholars that I respect believe that Mount Sinai was in what is modern-day Saudi Arabia. Okay, let's contrast Moses with Paul. When Moses brought Israel out of Egypt in the Exodus, book of Exodus, where did they go? The Sinai Desert. And you know what's funny? How do you spell Sinai? S-I-N, sin. AI. I don't know if they had AI back then, but yeah. But the desert, sin. Why did God take Israel out of Egypt? Because he wanted to take Egypt out of Israel. He wanted them to leave behind all those Egyptian gods and all their false doctrines. He took them in the desert so that they could leave their sins behind so that they could learn of the Lord, learn his ways, do the things that are pleasing to him. But a lot of them, they didn't want to leave Egypt in their hearts. And there's a verse for that. But uh, So, Paul, where did he go? where they went after they got left Egypt, to Sinai. Now, who was living in Sinai? Well, according to Bible scholars, and I believe this is my, my uh, research has showed me the same thing. Sinai was the land of Ishmael. Hmm. Who was Ishmael's mother? Hagar. 
Yeah. Where was she from? Oh, she was an Egyptian woman. Oh, okay. Yeah, let's let's take a look at that. Now, here we go. Book of Genesis. You know, if nobody bothers to read the book of Genesis, and then they only read the New Testament, they just, they miss a lot of things and, you know, don't even try to read the book of Revelation if you've never read Genesis. What a waste. You're wasting your time. You'll never get it. All right, so let's take a look at the Arab world from the eyes of God's word. We got to go back to the beginning and see what it says about Abraham. Now remember, Abram, Abraham's name was originally Abram. And he was married to Sarai. And God changed Sarai's name to Sarah. And he changed Abram's name to Abraham, which means many nations. God, Abraham was to be the father of many nations. And the modern church world wants you to think that one little nation over there in the Middle East is all of Abraham. God said Abraham's children would be like the sand on the seashore and the stars in the sky. And if you've ever been out in the desert, 20 miles away from any nearest city or town, there's a lot of stars up in that sky. You cannot even begin to count them all. There's probably millions of them. But that one little country over in the Middle East, that's all of Abraham. The churches will tell you, oh, that's for the fulfillment of Bible prophecy. Praise a Jesus. Uh, uh, yeah, well, I think it is the fulfillment of Bible prophecy. The wheat and the tares. God's gathering the tares. Yeah, the weeds to be bundled and burned. That part of the fulfillment of Bible prophecy. But what do I know? All right, so Abraham was married to Sarah, his wife. And they're really old. I forget how old they were. Uh, I think, I think, I think Abraham was like 10 years older than Sarah. You're talking like 70s and 80s, 90s, somewhere around there. They're old. Trying to have a kid at that age? Ah, forget it. But there's a verse in the Bible that says, is there anything too hard for God? Well, too, is there anything too hard for the Lord? And the answer is no. All right, so Abraham was married to Sarah's wife, and she was barren of children. So Sarah's like, you know, God promised me a, a us a kid, and we don't, yeah, it ain't, it ain't working. So why don't you take my little handmaiden here, Hagar, the Egyptian woman? Why don't you go in under her, and we can have a child by Hagar. And Abraham probably said, okay, no problem. I could do that. So in Genesis, uh, well, so after Abraham gets Hagar pregnant, in Genesis 16, 11, And the angel of the Lord said unto Hagar, her, her, Behold, thou art with child, and shalt bear a son, and shalt call his name Ishmael, because the Lord hath heard. That's what Ishmael means. Lord hath heard. Because the Lord hath heard thy affliction. See, Sarah was not happy with the whole deal. And she didn't treat Hagar very nicely. So, Ishmael's name means the Lord has heard, and he was Abraham's firstborn son. And Abraham as a father, well, he loved him greatly. 
And Abraham asked the Lord to make Ishmael the promised seed. And this is what the Lord said unto Abraham. Genesis 17 and verse 20. Now, why am I going all into all this? Because Arabia was where Ishmael's went. It's where Ishmael went. Yeah, they were Abraham's children too. Ishmael went to Arabia. And, you know, it's, they're Abraham's children too. Abraham was to be the father of many nations, not just one. Many nations. Genesis 17, 20. The Lord says, And as for Ishmael, I have heard thee. Okay, you want me to make Ishmael the promised seed. I have heard thee. Behold, I have blessed him. God blessed Ishmael. I have blessed him and will make him fruitful and will multiply him exceedingly. Twelve princes shall he beget, and I will make him a great nation. So look at this carefully. The Lord said he would bless Ishmael and make him fruitful and multiply him with twelve princes to make of him a great nation. But yet he was not to be the promised seed. The Arabic nations are blessed with oil, and they do have some very good crop growing areas. They really do. And do you know that there's hundreds of millions of Arabs? Hundreds of millions. And yet of the you-know-whos, there's what, 12 to 18 million? Uh, you know, you start thinking about it. Oh, wait a minute. Um... Wait a minute, God promised Abraham he'd be the father of hundreds of millions. The sand on the seashore. How come there's only 12 to 18 million you-know-whos in the Middle East? But yet Ishmael's descendants are hundreds of millions. I think there's, I think there's around five or six hundred million Arabs. I don't remember. I, I looked it up in a... a thing long ago but I'm guessing there's a half half a billion Arabs half a billion and there's only a under 20 million you know who's who did God bless hmm Genesis 17 19 and God said Sarah, thy wife, shall bear thee a son indeed, and thou shalt call his name Isaac. Isaac, and I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant, and with his seed after him. So Isaac was to be the promised seed, not Ishmael. And yet God blessed Ishmael for Abraham's sake. Now, the time was coming when there's like problems and friction in the family, which happens all the time when you got two sons by two different wives. Oh boy. You know, like I said before, guys think, oh yeah, man, having more than one wife, oh boy, uh, what a fantasy that is. Yeah, until the kids start fighting with each other, you know, uh or like uh, Absalom, King David's son, tried to kill his dad because he's like, well, I want to be king and I'm not, I don't want to wait. So I'm going to kill dad and take his place. Yeah. Yeah, no thanks. Uh, I think most people have enough problems with one spouse. And you know what happens if you got two? It's called double trouble. Yeah, double trouble. Don't need it. That's why Paul said a, a bishop should be the husband of one wife. Somebody send the Mormons, the morons, uh, a memo. Which is really a shame because one of my favorite musical artists when I was growing up, uh, Randy Bachman, is a Mormon. 
I'd really like to have him and yeah, but doesn't look like it's going to happen. Oh, uh, well, what are you going to do? All right. So in Genesis 21, verse 10, uh, so the, the uh, older kid, Ishmael, by the Egyptian woman, Hagar, starts mocking Isaac, the younger kid. So Sarah sees all this and she's not happy. She's not a happy camper. So what does she say? Genesis 21.10, Wherefore she, Sarah, said unto Abraham, Cast out this bondwoman and her son. Cast out Hagar, the bondwoman, and her son. For the son, Ishmael, of this bondwoman shall not be heir with my son, even with Isaac. I don't want this woman in my house with her kid. And Abraham was not exactly pleased with all this. I mean, he cared about it, uh, Ishmael. Genesis 21, 12. And God said unto Abraham, Let it not be grievous in thy sight because of the lad and because of thy bomb woman. In all that Sarah hath said unto thee, hearken unto her voice. Listen to Sarah. Listen to her. For in Isaac shall thy seed be called. Isaac is going to be the promised seed, period, not Ishmael. But if you listen to modern church world, they'll say, well, you know, the whole world can now believe in Jesus and they're going to be saved. Doesn't matter what they are, who they are, where they are. Don't matter. Jesus, God loves everybody. Uh, I don't think so. So, Sarah says, get him out of here. God says, hearken unto Sarah. Listen to her. Genesis 21, 15. And Abraham rose up early in the morning and took bread and a bottle of water and gave it unto Hagar, putting it on her shoulder and the child and sent her away. And she departed and wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba. And the water was spent in the bottle. And, you know, the water ran out. And she cast the child under one of the shrubs. You know, they're out in the desert, probably, and it's hot. And you know why it's a shrub? Because it's not a tree. Deserts do not have enough water to support a tree. So all they can have is shrubs. All right, so she places the child, Ishmael, under a shrub. You know, get him out of the sun. Uh, desert sun's brutal, people. You know, everybody's, <laughs> we have no, Americans have no idea, generally. Uh, you know, we live in our air-conditioned houses. That's going to change one day. Yeah, God's going to take away all his blessings from this evil, wicked nation, the West. All right, so the water's gone. She's in the desert. She puts the kid under a shrub to get him, try to get him out some shade. And... She's preparing to die. Genesis 21, 16. And she went and sat her down over against him a good way off, as it were a bow shot, you know, like a bow and arrow. So not too far. For she said, let me not see the death of the child. And she sat over against him and lift up her voice and wept. So she's crying out to God and she's weeping. She's crying. And God heard the voice of the lad, and the angel of God called to Hagar out of heaven and said unto her, What aileth thee, Hagar? You know, what's the matter, Hagar? Fear not, for God hath heard the voice of the lad where he is. Arise, lift up the lad, and hold him in thine hand, for I will make him a great nation. God promised he was going to make Ishmael a great nation. 
And of course, your modern church world will say, oh, well, the Arabs are not Ishmael. Oh, really? Where are they then? Where are these promises that God made? Where are they? Ask them. Uh, 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 what? You're being divisive. You got to leave this Bible study. You got to leave. You're trespassing. Get out of here. They'll give you the right foot of disfellowship in the butt because they're devils and they work for the devil. Absolutely. Genesis 21, 18, arise, lift up the lad and hold him in thine hand for I will make him a great nation. And God opened her eyes and she saw a well of water and she went and filled the bottle with water and gave the lad drink. And God was with the lad and he grew and dwelt in the wilderness and became an archer. So he bow and arrow. And he dwelt in the wilderness of Paran and his mother took him a wife out of the land of Egypt. I mean, come on, you know. So the Lord had mercy on Ishmael and made a promise to Abraham to make of him a great nation and multiply him. Many Arabs to this day claim that they're descended from Ishmael and Abraham. So, is it true? Looks like it matches, if you ask me. In Genesis 17.5, I mentioned God changed Abram's name. Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham, for a father of many nations have I made thee. Yeah, one little nation over in the Middle East with just a few million uh, they want you to think is the fulfillment of Bible prophecy. I don't think so. Where are these many nations? Was God unable to keep his promises? Did God lie? Oh, and I'm sorry. Um, the, uh, I thought there was a half a billion Arabs? No. About a quarter of a billion. About 250 million. So, yeah. All right, so what does the Bible say about Ishmael? Genesis 16, 12. And he, Ishmael, and he will be a wild man. Does that fulfill... Bible prophecy? Um, I used to work with a guy. He was from Morocco. Uh, Morocco's not a hotbed of Islam. I mean, they're kind of like Turkey. You know, they believe in Ish. I mean, uh, they believe in the Quran and Muhammad, but they're not crazy, crazy. You know, they're kind of a mild form of Islam. And Real nice guy. I, I worked with him and he lived not too far from me. So we used to carpool. And one time he came to my house and turned the TV on. And I think it was, I think it was the life of Brian on um, Monty Python. I never watched the movie. I just, I've seen some clips of it. I've never was much of a movie TV watcher, but uh, it showed the spaceship flying around and and he he points at me and says, is this what you believe, you know, about Jesus or whatever? I'm like, no, 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 dude. This is just a movie. This is just a movie. I don't know anything about this. And I saw fire in his eyes. I mean, I was like actually afraid of this guy. And up to that point, he had never shown any aggression at all. And I didn't even believe any of this stuff back then didn't even believe not one word so you know i i didn't believe in jesus back then so so and he will be a wild man and his hand will be against every man and every man's hand against him and he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren 
Hmm. So if we look at this carefully, he's he's to be a wild man. His hand was against every man, and he was to, supposed to live among his brothers, which Abraham's children. Now, if a pastor says, oh, that's not true about the Arabs, then ask him, well, okay, show, show us where, who fulfills this prophecy. Show us. They can't because they're liars. Unless, of course, they want to say God lies and or makes promises he can't keep. You know, that's, yeah. So, you know, and uh, let's see, the uh, Ottoman Empire, Muslims, you know, they've, uh, they attacked Greece, the capital of the Orthodox community in the East, which was Constantinople. Modern day today is called Istanbul. You ever heard of Bosnia? They conquered that. They conquered Spain and Portugal. They also conquered uh, parts, uh, well, yeah, Bosnia. And what else? Uh, oh, you ever heard of Count Vlad? You know, Dracula. Yeah, he was a real life figure, believe it or not. And yes, he did impale people. But who did he impale? Well, criminals, capital crime criminals. I heard he was a Christian. But he his kingdom got invaded by the Muslims. So if he captured Muslims, he impaled them and would leave them on the side of the road for the other Muslims to know that, well, hey, if we capture you, this is, you can count on this is what we're going to do. You show us no mercy, we will show you no mercy. But they then they turn him into a, a vampire. Yeah, drinking blood. Whose blood did he drink? Vlad. Oh, he was Christian. You know, the, the, the bread and the wine? You know, the Lord's Supper? Passover type thing? Yeah, yeah. But instead, Hollywood turns him into a neck-biting, blood-sucking vampire. Yeah, because they don't want you to know your history. Seriously. Um, the um, Arabs were actually at the step. The, they were uh, doing a siege of Vienna, which was the capital of Austria. Austria is the country south of Germany, right next to Switzerland. And guess what? Austria, um, I mean, Vienna was in Vienna, Vienna was in trouble, big time trouble. I mean, they were in danger of falling. So the king of Poland, which is like a neighbor, you know, he looked at it and he says, you know, if Austria and Vienna, the capital, if that falls, you know, crashes, collapses to the, the Ottoman Muslims, we're probably next. So he grabbed his entire army, the king of Poland, grabbed his entire army and the cavalry and everything else rode against the Muslims. And then uh, the Austrians were also fighting him, but between Poland and Austria, they defeated the uh, Ottoman Turks, defeated them. Otherwise, who knows, Austria might have been Muslim. And uh, sadly, uh, people don't remember these kind of history lessons. So, but you know what the difference between uh, Islam and the you know who's? Muslims consider Jesus to be a sinless prophet of God. I mean, they deny that God has a son, but they do consider him a sinless prophet. Of course, they consider Muhammad an even greater prophet because he came after. But the you-know-whos consider him a false prophet. So, yeah. So, there you go. 
So why, why am I going all this about Sinai and Ishmael and the Arabs and blah, blah, blah? Because Paul went to Sinai, which is where Israel went after the Exodus. Paul went to the same place. Paul went to the desert for three years to commune with Christ, to learn from him. He didn't go to humans to learn about Christ. He went to the desert and searched the scriptures, learned what everything he had learned as a, uh, a rabbi, and learned from Christ the New Testament. God took Israel out of Egypt Paul went to Egypt, well to the desert, same place that Israel went and wandered for 40 years. Paul went to the same place to learn of the Lord because he had to leave behind all the baggage of Babylon, the tradition of the elders. He had to leave that behind. Then he went back to Damascus and then he went to Jerusalem and hung out with Peter oh yeah think about it and there was two covenants there was the covenant with Hagar and Ishmael God promised he'd make him a great nation but then there was the covenant with Isaac and Sarah the chosen seed Ishmael was not to be the chosen seed you know why Arabs can't hear the gospel that's probably why that's probably why. So, oh, and by the way, Ishmael went to Arabia. That was where he ended up. And then from there, they spread out. When you read about the uh, Midianites and the Ishmaelites, yeah, you'll know who you're, the Bible's referencing in, in Genesis. Matter of fact, that was probably, I believe that was what, uh, when Joseph's brothers sold him into slavery, they were on their way to Egypt, and then they sold him under Pharaoh's uh, captain's household. Yeah. There's two covenants. There was Hagar and Ishmael. And then there was Jerusalem, Isaac from above. So let's read, let's, let's take a look at that. Galatians 4, Galatians 4. All right, let's start in verse 19. Galatians 4, 19. Paul speaking, my little children, of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you. You know, Paul's like saying, yeah, I'm trying to birth you in Christ. I'm trying to, you know. 20. I desire to be present with you now and to change my voice, for I stand in doubt of you. Yeah, you guys have been messing up. I'm, I'm, I doubt. Tell me, ye that desire to be under the law, do ye not hear the law? You know, why do you want to be under the law? I mean, I'd rather be under grace. Verse 22. For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondmaiden, which is kind of like a slave, really, the other by a free woman, Hagar versus Sarah. But he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh. But he of the free woman was by promise. God's promise. God promised Sarah. Which things are an allegory? For these are the two covenants. The one from the Mount Sinai, which gendereth to no bondage, which is Hagar. For this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. 
and answereth to Jerusalem, which now is and is in bondage with her children. Why was Jerusalem in bondage to the children? Because they didn't want they didn't want the grace of Christ, right? But Jerusalem, which is above, is free. That's why there's a new Jerusalem. Those in Christ. There's going to be a new Jerusalem one day. Not the present day filth infested, yeah, earthly. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. For it is written, Rejoice, thou barren that bearest not, break forth and cry, thou that travailest not, for the desolate have many more children than she which hath an husband. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. That as them, uh, but as them, he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit. You see, Ishmael persecuted Isaac. The children of the flesh persecuted those of the, the, the spirit, the promise. Nevertheless, what saith the scripture? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. And if you want to read a really great verse, read Galatians 3.29. And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs to the promise. So, Paul went to the desert. So, you know, seriously. So, I think this is an hour. So, I think what we're going to do is uh, close this out, make this a part two, and... Uh, We'll, uh, we'll take a look uh, part three, I guess. There's a lot of information. And a lot of this was previous studies that I've done, but I'm trying to weave them together, and it's a good refresher, like the Arab world and Bible prophecy. You know, they're going to play a part too in Bible prophecy, but people don't... You know, if you've never read the book of Genesis... How would you know any of this? And uh, I've actually had pastors when I was fairly new to the faith try to tell me, oh, well, don't bother reading the New Testament. I mean, the, uh, the Old Covenant, the Old Testament. Don't read that. That's for the, that's for the you-know-whos. That doesn't apply to you, liars. They are, they're liars. And they got a special place for them. Those that are lying, deceiving people. So, and you know what, people? You know what's scary about teaching the Bible? Is Bible teachers and pastors are held to a higher standard than anybody else. Yeah. Yeah. Somebody that doesn't know something's wrong from the Bible and they're doing it. They're going to be punished, but not as much as somebody that knew it was wrong and taught other people it was wrong. They're they're going to get they're going to get an extra special punishment. And uh, I know one day I'm going to have to give an account for every word, everything that I've ever taught. Yeah, it's scary at times, you know. But the difference between myself and others is I don't purposely try to mislead people like some of these satanic churches do so whatever i don't have a building with a mortgage by the bank where i have to teach their doctrines so i don't have a church at all 
So solve that problem. So I guess I'm the church of the internet. So all blessings, praise, glory, and honor. In Jesus' precious name, amen.